Hello everyone, I'm Rohit Sinha. As introduced, I'm a software engineer at Google. I work on an open data application platform called Sira. And today I will be talking about centralized metadata for multiple cloud data pipelines. So before I jump into multi-cloud and metadata and all the details about it, let me give a brief overview of what CDAP is. So CDAP is an open source platform for building and operating data op applications. Uh, CDAP can run um, on, um, on premise or on any cloud, um, either as a single VM or on a Hadoop cluster. The platform uh, CDAP uh, gives production runtime environment. It has a global metadata repository. It allows for orchestration, it exposes services, it provides security and also multi-tenancy. And on top of the platform, uh, we have uh, various accelerators, which are use case specific solutions. Um, so for example, for the uh, accelerators which we have is Data Pipeline, which um, helps user to create uh, various data processing jobs through uh, almost zero code, uh, uh, experience uh, through click and drag and run, do their data processing um, and operate on their data. We have data prep, which allow user to bring in data from different kinds of sources, do various kinds of transformation on them, and then analyze that data better. Uh, we have rules engine, which allows uh, users and businesses to define uh, business specific rules on top of the data which is being processed. Uh, MMDS allows user to uh, do machine learning without writing any code. And at last, we have ECA, Event Condition Action, which is a, um, uh, a product to solve use case for Internet of Things. So, uh, Talking about the brief customer journey, uh, a customer in CRAP start with data preparation where they bring in uh, their data from different sources, like those sources can be uh, AWS S3 files or GCS files or BigQuery, uh, irrespective of which cloud they are on, or they can be on Hadoop clusters. Uh, they can load that in data prep, do uh, explore that data, visualize it, and then do some kind of um, various kinds of transformations on that on a sample set of data. And after when they have satisfied with their uh, samples, uh, the transformations which they are doing on the sample set of data, they can create a data pipeline out of it. So this data pipeline uh, allows them to run the whole transformation on a huge, on a bigger, larger set of data. And the data pipeline can run either on a Hadoop cluster or on various uh, cloud runtimes. And while all this data pipeline is running and the data processing is happening, one of the key aspects which we capture is uh, the metadata and the lineage. So whatever processing you are doing inside CDAP, all the logs, metrics, metadata, and field level lineage of all the various data operations are being captured. I will get into uh, details about how, how that looks like inside CDAP and uh, how it can be used a little later in the uh, demo. So today, the, mostly the demo will, uh, talk will be focused on the metadata capabilities of CDAP and what metadata means and uh, what are the challenges of multi-cloud and how metadata can solve it. So enterprises are moving to multi-cloud and adopting multi-cloud and hybrid strategy. Uh, so uh, a uh, study done by Enterprise Strategy Group in 2017 concluded that 75% of current public cloud infrastructure customer use uh, multiple cloud. And enterprises are moving to multiple cloud because it allows them to use the best tool for the task which they are doing. They're not tied to tool or technologies given by just one cloud provider. They can evaluate them independently and go and use that specific tool. It avoids uh, lock-in, as in like enterprise has the freedom to choose the most cost-effective solution, and they're not at the mercy of one particular cloud to be updated or provide them some technologies. And overall, it also reduces risk and guarantees business continuity uh, uh, by giving redundancy, as in, they are not affected by a single cloud provider outage or uh, some kind of legal terms and uh, specific to that particular cloud. So uh, 
There's another uh, prediction done by IDC, which says that more than 85% of the enterprise IT organization will commit to multi-cloud architecture by 2018, and which we are seeing that uh, already. So as the enterprises are moving to multi-cloud, uh, there are a lot of challenges which comes with the movement to multi-cloud. So um, some of those challenges are, most most of those challenges are related to data management in multi-cloud because the data is moving to various clouds. Uh, the challenges are how to discover the data across cloud. How do we uh, propagate the metadata associated with the data in multiple clouds? The visibility aspect, like how does enterprise understand how the data is being transferred across clouds? Retention and compliance and access control, who can do what in, when they are in multiple clouds? So for example, let's just take a simple uh, use case of uh, rule, um, right to be forgot, uh, forgotten. So which is very hard problem to solve in a single, single cloud or even an on-prem uh, cluster. And once you move to a multiple cloud where your data resides in multiple environments and the processing is happening outside of where the data resides, this problem becomes significantly harder to solve because you have to worry about how do we discover data which needs to be deleted or something like that. So I don't think that metadata needs any kind of description, but I will just like try to summarize what it is. Um, so it helps, metadata, the key aspect is it helps in data management. Um, it's, metadata can in one line can be described as data about the data itself and doesn't need any further definition because it has been existed from the time when data existed. It has been used to classify, organize, categorize data for a long time. And this is especially needed in big enterprises where they have multiple, uh, a multitude of data coming from numerous sources in different formats. And all of them are independent and they want to tie them to understand them better. So metadata can serve as that key to uh, tie all these different data sets in different formats to understand the data and have better insights in that. So if we have to broadly classify metadata, we can classify it into three uh, broad categories. First is the technical metadata, which is basically metadata which describes the data itself. For example, it can be the uh, spectrum of a file, the schema of a data set, and stuff uh, around the uh, description of the data. The second uh, metadata category is operational, which is which defines how the data was created, um, audit, lineage, metric, when the data is being processed and resulting to another data set creation, all of these metadata which is being created by the data processing, that is the operational <coughs> metadata associated with that data. And the third is the business data, business metadata, this is mostly user defined. It is specific to a business taxonomy and terminology. Like for example, if you have a data which contains some personal identifiable information, then a business might want to tag it with PII so that they can further process, identify that, okay, this data set contains some personal identifiable information. So the power of metadata lies in, uh, the um, enablement. It enables the enterprise to do a lot of things. So if we walk down through the different aspects, and I'm pretty sure there's much more to metadata than this slide summarizes it, but if we just focus on these parts. So for example, in a, in a enterprise, uh, when you have, as I mentioned, they have, like enterprises have to deal with like numerous amounts of data from different sources. One of the key challenges, how to classify them, how to uh, discover them on basis of the classification. And as enterprises move to multi-cloud where the data is residing in multiple clouds, it becomes much more harder to uh, classify the data which resides in multiple clouds. The second aspect is access control. Since the data is being copied from one cloud to another cloud to do various processes, enterprises generally have some kind of access control policies around the data. Now they have to worry about doing this, applying the same policies um, on the other side. Let's say if you are in AWS and you are using some IAM there, if you move some data to GCS, you have to again worry about applying those policies in, GCS, uh, in Google Cloud too. 
So metadata can help with that uh, too. For example, the, the key aspect is that metadata separates the resource classification from the actual authorization enforcement. For example, let's say you have a data set which contains some sensitive information and you define a tag called uh, PII and then you define a policy on the tag itself rather than the resource which is the data set and you say that the particular group can act only some particular groups can access any resource which is tagged with PII. So now whenever a new resource creation happens all it needs to be done to make that authorization enforcement up the Kimball is to tag that resource with PII. Um, and it, the privilege does not have to be defined when the resource has, is being created. Um, the third aspect is the retention policy. So once enterprises start dealing with multiple clouds, the data is residing in various different storage, um, it becomes challenging to identify which data needs to be retained for how much time, when does the deletion happens, and stuff like that. A lot of time, the enterprises choose to organize their data according to the retention policy, so that it's much more easier to come in and clean stuff up, but that's very complex, and that takes away the natural organization of the data, or the business-specific organization of the data, which the business want to do. So metadata can help with that too. So let's say if you have a tag which defines what is the retention policy, and then you have some process which just like finds out all the resources which you have tagged with that retention policy tag, then it can look up those resources and then clean that up. And your resources does not need to be organized depending upon the retention policy and can follow the business per stake or their natural organization. Um, uh, it also helps with discovery. Let's say you have different data sets residing in multiple cloud to identify, to find out data sets. For example, all the data sets which have some personal identifiable information, you can just do a search with a metadata like PII and you can look up in multiple clouds to find where all those data sets are. But two key aspects of metadata uh, and the lineage aspects of metadata is the root cause analysis and the impact analysis. The impact analysis is um, finding out how does the data set affect other data set. Let's say you have a data set which has been involved in a lot of processing and you find out that there is some inconsistency in data. The first thing which you want to do is find out what are the data set and what are the other processes which this data was used in so that you can find other data set which got affected by that, uh, by that inconsistency. So if you have a visibility into how different fields of a data set is contributing to uh, new data set fields, then you can do that impact analysis. The other, this is like moving forward as how a field create, cause creation of other fields. The other um, aspect is moving backwards. So if you find out like there's some inconsistency in the data set, you want to understand what was the operation which lead to that inconsistency. So if you have the visibility in the operation which uh, were done to create that field, you can look back and see the source fields and the operations which were done to identify and debug what was the process which leads to this uh, inconsistency. Um, it can, metadata can also uh, help with automation. For example, let's say you have a data set um, which contains personal identifiable information and you can have like trigger defined upon like whenever a data set lands in your data lake um, which containing a uh, PII, tag it with a PII and also send a notification email to some administration, administration or something like that. A uh, lot of time there are data which is confidential and sensitive and there are legal laws with processing that. So businesses cannot process that. But the metadata associated with that data set can help in monetizing that data. A typical example will be cell phone and text messages metadata, uh, which can be, if you look at those uh, phone calls and messages metadata, you can monetize it to better understand a user. And also in a big enterprise where there are different orgs and then they are moving to different multiple uh, clouds and different departments are using different clouds and different kind of solution, everyone is creating their own data set. It becomes a very hard problem to 
drive and share the meaning of the data set. So metadata can help in standardizing the terminology which a business uses um, to understand the data and share that data with across the org. So I will pick up a use case here, um, which is, let's say an enterprise has files on AWS. They want to do some kind of data processing on those files, and then they want to move that uh, resultant data set to Google Cloud Storage. And those source files have some metadata, some business metadata associated with it. And they want to move those business metadata from the source file to the sync file so that um, it gets propagated and they can know that these were the source files which has those metadata and this sync also has that metadata then. Um, and they also want the visibility in the operation. They want to know once the result in data set has been created, they can look that data set up, they can look that field up, and they can understand how, what was the operations which were done, from where did this data came from, and how it impacted um, the uh, fields of the data set. And at the end, like they also want to discover across multiple clouds, um, irrespective of whether this file resides on Amazon S3 or whether this file resides on GCS. So discovery by the users of the system. So let's say if I have some file stored in Amazon S3 and I want to do some kind of processing, move it to Google Cloud Storage uh, for some other people to use that. And they are, these files have some metadata associated with it. Now I want to, and let's say that S3 file has some personal identifiable information. And my processing copied some of those information to this another file, which is hosted on S3, uh, on GCS. Now when I want to find out all my data set, which has some kind of personal identifiable information, if I'm just limited to looking into um, one cloud provider, then I miss this part where this data processing happened, which moved that data from one cloud to another cloud. So the discovery aspect is like, you want to discover, discover data set based on the metadata across clouds or across environments. Um, yeah, so that's the use case. And now I will do a small demo, which kind of like will go into details as how CDAP can be used to um, uh, hand, uh, uh, fulfill this use case. So I have a pipeline here uh, where, uh, which reads from two different data sets which are on Amazon S3. So I have a data set called customers. And if I come in here, I can see that customer, I have given it a business tag that customer's data set contains some personal identifiable information. So I have tagged it with PII. And then I have another data set called sales, and my sales has been tagged with finance to represent that this data set belongs to the finance department, and some another business taxonomy gold. Um, so I want to read these two data sets. I want to sanitize them, clean them up. Um, that's what I'm doing here, is basically cleaning those data set um, uh, data. And then I want to join them on some uh, some fee here in this example that is the customer ID. And then once that is being done and I have a result in data set from that drawing process, I want to push that to Google Cloud Storage. So I, I'm sending it to Google Cloud. And if I come in here, uh, at this point it does not have any metadata associated with it. It just has like some system metadata associated with it. But in this operation when this data processing is being done, I'm moving some of the personal identifiable information from the customer data set to this resultant data set which is going to Google Cloud. And I want to, con so I want that metadata to be moved, but I don't want to move all the metadata to uh, the resultant data set. I want to specify, specifically pick some of the metadata which I'm interested in. So that's like a custom action which we have, which you can, like, which I just, simply load to like pick up just, I'm just interested in propagating PII and finance. So I will not propagate the gold method tag 
which this um, data set was tagged with. So I can come in here and run this pipeline. It runs, currently it's running on a very small data set locally, so it should be super quick. So as you can see, um, the pipeline is reading different data sets. We can see the metrics of how many records are being read and processed. Once the pipeline is done, then we can jump into and look into more details. So it's succeeded. And I can come into my Google Cloud. So this data set is stored in Google Cloud. I can jump into here, and I can see that the meta, like in this data processing, it got tagged with PII and finance tag, which I want it to be. And I can also come in, and I can look at the lineage to understand, like, once this data set has been moved, I want to look up the two aspects was the impact analysis and the root cause analysis. So I can see that this data set was created through a pipeline which run, and this pipeline read two external data sets, sales and customers. Um, and we can go even one level granular that we can look at the field level deviates. So I can come in here, and I can see that customer with product has these fields. The city field came from the data set called customer. And I can click on the view operation, and I can see that the customer was read from Amazon S3. Then I do some parsing as CSV, which led to these comma-separated fields. Then it went through a join operation, but this, fee this uh, field city was not changed in that join because my join was done on some other field. And at the end, it was written to a data set customer with output. Um, I can also look at some other fields from other data sets, like for example, this product ID, this came from a data set called sales. Um, and this will just tell the same thing, but it says that it came from another data set called sales and how that data set fields were read and how it was uh, written to this thing. Um, one important thing here is the ID. So I can see that this is the field which was um, result of two different data sets because this which one this was the field on which I joined my data set. If I look at the operations, I can see that uh, two data sets were the input, sales and customer. Both of the data sets were read from Amazon S3 and then parsed as CSV to generate some field. And then it was um, a part of a join operation where it was used as the key and at the end written to this data set. I can, so this is like looking back. I can also look in forward that I can see customer and I can see the impact this customer data set has. So this customer data set resulted into generating um, another data set called customer with product. So earlier we were looking, uh, looking back, which was the root cause analysis. Now we are looking forward, which is the impact, like what does this data set impact? We can also look in discovery. Uh, so I can come in metadata, and I want to find all my data sets which contains personal identifiable information. So all I have to do is search PII. So I know, like, I have two data sets. They are, they are at two different clouds. The customers were stored on Amazon S3. The customer with product, which was my resultant data set, is stored on Google Cloud. But I can find them out both here. I can also search with finance, which gives me the sales and the same data set. It's also possible to look up by your storage. You want to find all your data set which are on S3. So I can search with S3, and it will show me the data set which I have stored on S3. So sales and customers are stored on S3. But my sync, which was customer with product, was on GCS. So I can search with GCS, and I can see that this was my a data set which was um, which is stored on GCS. And if you remember, I have a tag called gold, which was, uh, and only the sales data set was tagged with it. And I choose not to propagate this to my thing. So if I search with it, 
I only see my sales, which was one of my sources and not these things. So that gives you a discovery, doing discovery uh, across clouds. So coming back to the demo. Uh, so in conclusion that we, uh, we have shown that CDAP uh, with its metadata capability can help with uh, doing data discovery across clouds. Um, and we can selectively propagate metadata from source to sync. And you also get visibility into operations, irrespective of where your data sets is being stored and what kind of data processing you are doing. You can look up a data set and find out where the sources were, how they contributed, and stuff like that. Questions? Yeah. No, you, no, you don't. I can I can show you. I can try showing you. I don't think I am not sure if I have the data here. So we have something called data prep, which you can come in and, for example. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Once I find the data set, I will make it big. Uh, one second. Okay, so this is my, like, this is hosted locally on my file system right now, but I have this file on Amazon S3 from where I was doing the demo. So you can create connections here. You can add a connection here to uh, read files from database, Kafka, S3, Cloud Storage, BigQuery, or Cloud Spanner. So I have the sales which I can load up. I can, so this is just a text, I read it as a text file. I can come in and I can do parse as CSV. And then it parses the whole text file as CSV. And then you can do various operations. And once you are done with, like you can format them, you can filter the data sets. And once you are done with it, you click on create pipeline and you get a pipeline out of it, which can do the same thing on a much larger scale of data. That CSV is the actual data living on the S3, but the tags like PII or finance or sale is the metadata associated with it. So the customer data set contains information about customer, like address, zip code or something, which I, my business, declare as a personal identifiable information. So I tag them that this is a PII. So any data set which gets generated from this data set should have that tag if it consists of those fields and stuff like that. Hey there. So my question then gets into exactly what you were just trying to show there, but everybody who's dealt with more than one database knows that you have things like mismatches between ASCII or UTF-8 or Unicode, right? Just that kind of transform could be a nightmare. Uh, you have like enumerated lists, like two different databases using a different pop-up for the country code, right? So different enumerated lists. You have all those kind of data transformations here. So does this really kind of solve that issue, or is that something to still be solved beyond that? So CDAP solves those issues of the difference. So if you are dealing with two different storage, you have to deal with how to store them in those storage. But the aspect which we are talking about here is like once the data is stored, the metadata associated with it and discovering it. Now, if it's about like moving data from here to there in different formats, and when the enterprise is doing it, they have to either use um, uh, CDAP to write that logic of like 
reading it in this format. And we have a lot of plugins and uh, extension which help you with re reading. So let's say if you want to read a uh, BigQuery source, you don't have to go and write all the logic of how to read a BigQuery table. You can just bring it in and then you have those data as records and you can process that record with, in the format with CRAP understand and then you want to push it to MySQL. Mm -hmm. So we have a plugin which can write to MySQL from the standard format to the format which is um, appropriate for MySQL. And if there is some completely different kind of storage which CRAP does not support at this point, our core architecture is completely extensible. You can write your, you can take our APIs, write your own plugin which can write to that thing or read from a different source and depending upon what kind of storage format they have. Okay, thank you. So you said a uh, read or write from a particular sync or a source, right? So like in the example that you just showed, does the pipeline get automatically triggered on an S3 event, uh, file event, or do you have to schedule it and... Uh... So at this point we have time-based scheduling where you can say like okay. this pipeline has to be triggered at a particular time, but it's possible to have custom triggers where you, you can trigger it on basis of amount of data which get pushed into a file or some kind of action which is being happening. So we do have some tools with So what is the scalability of CDAP? Like scalability like yeah. uh, how much I think, data? Yeah, I think you just answered the processing engine being could be MapReducer's part, yeah. right? Yeah. It's scalability. Probably you talk to so it's basically CDAP platform itself, you know, it's a dis distributed both in terms of uh, data storage as well as uh, Oh, so there's a 
uh, execution happens in the on-cloud. So, for example, you can run this on a server cluster, or you can run this on a nesting site cluster, or you can run this on a cluster. Everything will run on one cluster, as opposed to running in multiple different clouds. So, job itself will not be run in different clouds, but you can pull data from different clouds and handle them. The compute resource already will be either in data clouds or server cluster. But you can choose where to do that computation. Yeah, you can put it in Google Cloud, or you can put it in Amazon S3. But the system metadata and the system logs are stored where CDAP is running. If you have CDAP running in a Hadoop cluster, it will be stored there. But you can push your data to any of the yeah, they, yeah, they will use that metadata locally to know where the data yeah. lives. You get that data, you do the computation, and you yep. store it in the cloud that you're yeah. Okay, got it. What about the CLAP is fault tolerance? I mean, what happens if CLAP is gone away? Should it can be restarted, or can I follow my workflows? When I, I, so can you repeat the question? You know, if CLAP is broken, mm -hmm. like thing, I, I I understand that this is a workflow management, and while working to my workflow, <clears throat> what even if CLAP is broken? So there's like two kinds of failures which can typically happen. Is first is because of the user code. You are doing some operation and you wrote incorrect code or your data is corrupted and we can, the the pipeline itself fails, the workflow pipeline itself fails. That does not bring down the platform. You can, like, that will fail your pipeline. And then you have visibility as why it happens by looking at the logs and the metrics and stuff. You can debug your code and understand, like, if for some, let's say, if you say that this schema field should not be nullable, and while doing, while processing it, we saw a null, then we will say that, oh, this field was null, where the schema said it's not null. So that's one kind of failure which is because of the, the where the pipeline fails. The other failures can be where the system, the CRAP system can fail because of, let's say, it goes out of memory or because of some bugs. So that's when you have to look in, like, that's where the we will come in to, like, find out the issues and stuff like that. So, for example, if a container fails or something like that in the CRAP control plane itself, there's high availability built in so that uh, new services that are spawned so that you have uh, active standby kind of a scenario where you can have continuous availability. But as, uh, as Droid mentioned, if the workflow itself has failed, then you need to take corrective actions to uh, restart the workflow. And it can re restart automatically, or should I follow the CLAP system is still up and running or not? Uh, if the workflow fails, then you have to restart it manually. But if CLAP itself fails, then there is active standby mode, so there is a recovery built in in CLAP itself. And what about the data loss? If CLAP is failed, mm -hmm. what happens in that case? So the data is landed in either Hadoop or any of the clouds, so the reliability is provided by the providers of the cloud. So there's probably the data, the metadata is stored in CLAP, but all the, the actual data is not stored within CLAP, it is stored by the underlying uh, storage mechanisms that they're using be it like a database or like a S3 or GCS and things like that. Okay, thank you. Sorry? Do you support this view actual That's been a frequently asked feature, but we don't uh, provide that at this point. So right now the uh, unit of execution is a workflow, so it all succeeds or all fails. Okay. Thank you. So it's a really right now. So do you have any, any uh, production uh, example, example for example, production? Yeah, there are several there are several examples. Um, um, AT and T as a customer, Salesforce, um, Thomson Reuters, um, they, are, they are using uh, CWT. They are our biggest customers. There are about twenty five to thirty people who are using this in production. Uh, hi, one quick question. Imagine. There are about 30 customers or so running things in production. Thomson Reuters, Salesforce, um, Vizient. There are a few people I recall on top of my head, uh, but there are 30 plus customers who are running in production. Uh, just one quick question. So you mentioned that uh, CDAP is running on top of Hadoop. So metadata repository itself is also stored uh, inside Hadoop or somewhere else. 
So CDAP can run either locally on your sandbox, which I have been showing here, but CDAP can also run Hadoop. So in that case, we choose the storage provider. So when CDAP is running on a Hadoop cluster, we store our metadata uh, on HBase. Oh, okay. Yeah.